I'm interested in the direction that the Academy is taking. And um, I, I, I wonder if it's uh, proper to try to write the ship or just let the iceberg and the ship do a little mating dance and, and start building a, a life raft off to the side. What is the actual strategic landscape right now for intellectuals? You know, like, is it even worth it to be an academic anymore? Is that is higher education, as we know it, even going to last much longer? Mm -hmm. um, you know, should if, if you're I'm a, you know, if you're a 32 year old academic such as myself uh, or any type of like serious intellectual in, in or out of the academy, does it make any sense to even spend your time trying to put in, you know, to pay your dues in these like legacy institutions? Mm -hmm. Um, when, you know, the amount of kind of nonsense that you have to sort of invest yourself in for years and years, the, the, the academy doesn't even have that much to offer you anymore. Like its credibility has never been lower. People mm -hmm. are, people's attention has never been less focused on the academy. And, you know, with all these different types of, you know, new currents out there and different types of monetization models, yeah. it's just from my view as an academic, the, what academia asks of me right now that basically is a sacrifice to a vital intellectual life is not worth it to me. And that's why I'm on the Internet saying and doing basically whatever the fuck I want, because if I like if the if the academy decides that I'm not allowed to do what I'm currently doing inside of the academy, then that will just be direct evidence that the academy is not where any rational, intelligent person would want to invest their efforts. Um, and so I, but I don't know if that, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's my yeah. sense of things. Like yeah. my sense of things is that it makes less and less sense to play the game of academia, given all of the costs of that game, when you can just go straight to the people as it were straight to the internet and just full time do like, you know, an academic job right now, it's like, it's 50% like bureaucracy basically. Mm -hmm. And all kinds of paying homage to all kinds of, you know, like cognitive taxation basically. Hmm. And the other 50% is, yeah, you get to like write papers and, and talk at conferences and stuff like that. Um, and that used to make sense because you used to have to, you used to have to kind of uh, pay your dues in this kind of prestige economy to be able to get that platform, to get the income, to get attention. But nowadays, like a, the Academy doesn't even offer you more attention or, you know, respectability or credibility than you can get by just being a smart person and laying it all out there on the internet, but it does ask you to do a whole bunch of bullshit that no one on the internet forces me to do. So I'm kind of like, it doesn't make sense for me to even play the academic game anymore. I think it only makes sense to play the academic game if what you really care about is a kind of, is like career stability and and, okay. and status yeah. and kind of financial stability. Like if those are yeah. the things you're optimizing, it makes sense to be an academic. But if, if you actually just wanna have the most productive uh, intellectual life possible and the most free intellectual life possible, it seems like I think you'll see more and more academics defecting from academia because it's just not even worth it, I think. But can you provide your consumer something of as much value as the academy can provide outside of the academy? Well, the one thing that yeah. the academy can give is this thing called a degree, right? It can certify that somebody has learned something. And without that, that's the one thing that I see that academia has that the internet, internet doesn't. For sure. You're right. But notice that that's a slightly different question. By the way, we are just kind of still just warming up talking with each other, right? I don't know. It sounds like we're, we're in the, we're I guess in the I, weeds I guess already. I was getting right into it. <laughs> what you were talking about is, is the education system. And some people are interested in, you know, what is the ideal education system going to be that replaces the obviously kind of uh, defunct and increasingly inefficient, increasingly ineffective current higher education system. A lot of people are interested in that question, but that's actually, I think, a much bigger, more difficult question that has to do with, yeah, things like you're talking about accreditation and, and market market problems. To me, I'm more interested in a, a, a very different question, which is just how to be an intellectual today. Mm -hmm. You know, if what you want to do is is live an intellectual life, and that means you want to achieve as much time as possible dedicated to seeking the truth on questions of interest and expressing those truths to the to the greatest you know public effectiveness, if that's what it means to live an intellectual life, as the way, I, and that's the way that I see it. If that's what you're trying to do, then what is the best way to do that today? What does that actually look like today? And I think we're still on this kind of inertia, where hmm. most people still imagine that being an academic is one of the best ways to do it. In a lot of people's minds, 
it's one of the only ways to do it. And I think that's that's becoming less and less clear every month, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with the all the number of, uh, you know, academics who are in one way or another either being fired or quitting or defecting. Or defecting and then yeah. all of the unspoken cases of young people who, you know, really smart young people who kind of see what's going on and they don't even go into academia because they're building the next big thing on their YouTube channel or whatever it might be. You know what I mean? So um, I think that's all happening more more rapidly than people realize. And Mm -hmm. just from my personal perspective as an academic, as someone who's, you know, I'm a successful young academic uh, who's basically finishing the kind of the early career phase of my of my academic career. And I'm, you know, I'm probably up for promotion soon. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing well in academia, but it's increasingly just like, I'm looking around the lifestyle and I'm looking around the institutions and I'm just kind of like, I just want to spend my time thinking. I don't want to do the bureaucracy. I don't really want the status or the, the, the financial security. I just want like the most radical and free, full intellectual life I want. And it's just increasingly clear to me anyway, that that's academia is not where that's at. And so, Hmm. Yeah, I'm 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 in the process of navigating a kind of some kind of transition. I don't I don't know exactly what it's going to look like and I don't know how it's going to play out, but clearly I mean I'm putting I'm putting more and more in my more and more of my eggs in the basket of mm-hmm. just saying whatever the fuck I want on the internet, blogging and and doing these videos and stuff like that and just letting the chips fall where they may, I guess. Yeah, it seems like the digital revolution, it hit music first with Napster and then iTunes uh, uh, concretized the the monetization model for that. And then it went to BitTorrent with TV and movies. And then we have Netflix and these other streaming ser- services. And now it's hitting this ancient uh, organism, this, this elephantine, uh, ancient thousands of years old institution. And what's that going to shake out? What what's gonna what's gonna fall out? What are the models that are going to be able to provide monetization for the people who provide the consumer worthwhile product? Exactly, exactly. I mean, I would love to hear your views on that because you know I, I like what you're doing, and it seems like you know you're you're working on a pretty serious kind of internet project. So I mean, I part of the reason I wanted to talk to you is just to kind of hear your take on this. Like, how do you see it playing out? Mm-hmm. And you know, your experience so far, like, you know, maybe if you want to respond to that, then I can ask you some other questions but or whatever. Well, the, the question that we could probably both meet at is that what, what are we providing as intellectuals? What are we providing? And so we have to study what, what people want and what they don't necessarily want, but they will find more satisfaction if we can trick them into wanting it. Like, and by, I mean, by that, I mean, you start with the uh, salacious material, you start with the headline, you start with the clickbait and then where you go from there is where you start to, I don't know if you specialize your audience or you cultivate within a broader audience, a, a, a hunger for deeper questions. And, and right. the trick is, I think, leading people down a path into, into more and more nuance, more and more tensions between subtle points of view rather than that huge clash that's on the surface. That's interesting, that, the way you think about it, because I think about it through a kind of different frame. I think about it in terms of I feel like what's going on, the, the larger kind of economic trend that, that we're living through right now is one in which people are sorting more and more rigorously into economic niches that suit their unique traits and gifts and and personalities. And you see that as an economic frame. I see this as an economic process. I, what it looks like to me is that the basically contemporary kind of global techno capitalism is heating up so much. And it's, it's putting a lot of competitive pressure on, on people's lifestyles. So like to, to eke out a good living for yourself in a current Western country, um, you know, you have to be really good at something. Mm-hmm. And the best ways to be really good at something is to find the thing that best reflects your unique set of gifts. Mm-hmm. And the part of that is and actually personality traits, kind of temperamental features that aren't necessarily thought of as economic are kind of a part of that, especially in this kind of screen crazy hyper digital media environment that we're living in. And so the way that I actually see this is the way it looks to me is that all of the culture markets are increasingly being fragmented in this kind of hyper refined way according to kind of personality traits and kind of affective, emotional types of identifications. And Could so you give, a, like, give an example, like Alex Jones yeah. versus Quillette or something like that? Yeah, sure. All of these would, like, all of those kind of current 
um, big names in independent media. You know, and you let's we can just rifle off a few of them, right? People will know them, like Quillette. You said Alex Jones, someone like Jordan Peterson, someone like Joe Rogan. What all of these people are, the way that I see it, is like you know, in the '60s and '70s, we had you know, well before cable, more like the '50s and '60s. You know, you know the story. I'm sure we had you know like three you know news channels, right? So there was not that much option. There was like whatever, whoever, whoever the fuck, Walter Cronkite, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Tom Brokaw, these like big, big iconic individuals who spoke to the entire nation. If you didn't relate to Tom Brokaw, uh, or Walter Cronkite, no one really gives a shit if that doesn't match your personality. You didn't have any choice, Hmm. but with the explosion of media choice, then what happens is you can have 3000 Walter Cronkites and what they're primarily different in is their personality. You know, there are intellectual differences, there are cognitive differences, there are all kinds of individual differences. But what's the underlying model that I see playing out is Mm -hmm. a fractioning um, based on uh, like a smaller number of of players who optimize a particular kind of personality niche. Mm -hmm. So like if you're kind of smart and you like ideas and you're you're kind of into philosophy and stuff like that or whatever, you're into politics and, and thinking critically about politics. But you also are like a meathead bro and you like to lift weights and fight MMA. You're going to like you're going to love Joe Rogan. So Joe Rogan is going to be the Walter Cronkite of all the people who are interested in talking about ideas and learning about the news, but who have a personality similar to and traits similar to someone like Joe Rogan. So currently, Joe Rogan is the king of all of the people who have traits at all kind of like Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what I think we're going to see each passing year is there is some sort of sub Joe Rogan that covers most of the same interests but is slightly different than Joe Rogan, yeah. but a little bit more refined. So maybe like you're kind of like Joe Rogan, but you're a um, you're a devout, um, you know, Protestant theologian. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to get all, of the millions of people who watch Joe Rogan and give yeah. Joe Rogan a more than ample lifestyle. Yeah. All of the people who are hardcore Christians, it might only be one tenth. It might only be, you know, point zero one uh, percent of the Joe Rogan fan base that are hardcore Protestant Christians. But if you can do like a real thing and you're and you're really into it and you're supplying that type of worldview and information and entertainment, then all of those people who are currently devoted to Joe Rogan are going to switch to be more devoted to you because the, the alignment is more direct. Their identification, mm-hmm. their emotional experience is more direct. And I think what I think you're seeing this happen actively. I think this is act. We're in yeah. the process of this in real time. Yeah. It's happening. And I think the ultimate long run kind of trajectory of it is that you're going to have a bewildering quantity, a huge quantity of small communities that are super highly um, refined Hmm. according to like what people genuinely most desire and are interested in. It will that, that, do you think that that will lead to a greater fracturing of uh, society with regards to like tribalism and fighting uh, between these groups? Do you think that'll, that'll increase? I think it's going to get much worse. Really? Yeah. I'm hopeful that after that, there might be some process of more authentic and genuine and healthy kind of uh, aggregation from mm-hmm. those bases. But all of the people out there currently who are kind of doing speaking tours talking about how we need to heal the conflict, we need to, you know, depolarize, we need to make liberals and conservatives be able to talk to each other better. I think it's a lovely idea. If it was possible, I would I would be, you know, I'm sympathetic to the to the idea emotionally. But I think it runs absolutely counter to everything that's actually baked into the hardcore kind of economic processes underway right now. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's it's basically a kind of fairy tale that again, I think it's inertia. I think public intellectuals are for years. That's just been the frame. That is what you say in every popular book you write for Penguin or whatever it might be the case. You it always has some sort of frame about here's the social problem and then here's like the the liberal solution about how we're going to heal here's a way that we can heal society to make everyone get along. Like that's just an inherited frame and um, it kind of made sense when there when you had a super centralized kind of uh, uh, media structure and, and kind of broadcast structure hmm. because you could pretend that you're kind of you're going to be the healer talking to everyone. You're going to you're going to send the ideas out into the world that gets everyone on the same page because everyone has to listen to you. But we're so past that already that, you know, like if you're a kind of a high highbrow intellectual and you have a book with Penguin or whatever, like. You think you act as if you're still talking to everyone, but you're not. You're you're hmm. you're still talking to a lot of people and you can have a lifestyle that way. But it's only a small number of people actually respect you and and take that seriously. Whereas 
the greater majority of everyone else is plugged off into like a bunch of other little niches. Yeah. So I think like there's a lot of signaling about how we all need to get along and we need to aggregate and build interests at a collective level. And I think it's mostly kind of fantasy and I, because I think it sells and I think it's I think it's a kind of inertia uh, hmm. uh, narrative that that's just been around for a long time. Are, are you saying that it, it's uh, it's a fool's errand to try to cultivate within one's audience the ability to switch audiences and switch focuses and still maintain integrity in that plugging into another voice, plugging into another community? Oh, I wouldn't say that. I think that sounds lovely. I think that's the kind of open mindedness and um, intellectual diplomacy that I'm quite interested in. That I, I try to do with myself and that I try to affect and 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 share and cultivate yeah. with myself and my friends and also like my viewers or whatever and my readers. So I, I think you and I have that in common. I think the people in our types of niches, you know, but again, that that's our personalities. That's the mm. types of people that we are. That's mm -hmm. what we're interested in. And the only people that are going to watch us and enjoy that and participate in that hmm. are the relatively small set of people who are already relatively predisposed to doing that. <laughs> and that, you know, it might be a, it might be a fairly large number of people, but the larger fragmenting processes that are underway in in kind of the body politic strike me as much more much larger, much more severe, and kind of underway more rapidly. Is is uh, it's kind of depressing, but that that's how I see it. I think. Yeah, I was, th this thought just struck me last night. I was thinking about, I don't know the exact dates, but in, in England during the, like the Reformation and after the, the printing press came out, there was all these pamphlets. There was just this explosion of pamphlets and this explosion of people like discoursing with the religion. And it seems like the whole uh, conservative uh progressive clash right now is replicating what we saw in England during that period, I think the 16th, uh, 15th, 16th century between c Catholicism and Protestantism. And that became very, very violent. Do you, are you ver well versed in that uh, era? I know a little bit about, yeah, the, the, you know, the relationship between the printing press and then the Protestant yeah. Re Reformation. I'm not, I'm no expert at all, but I'm, I'm very aware of what you're talking about. Sure. Yeah. I just wonder if like, if we look back at that period of history, we can see the ways in which things stabilized after that really rowdy period. And was it just everybody decided to be, uh, were forced to believe this certain thing or did they figure out a way of discussing these issues that didn't involve, uh, full on Internecine warfare. Whoa. Hey, not sure what happened. Whenever uh, I ask the really difficult questions, Skype's like, shit, don't, we're not going there. We're not going there. It's the CIA, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a really good question. To be honest, my answer to that question is I'm not sure that the frenzy of the Protestant Reformation ever did stabilize. Hmm. I, I, I do think you really can tell a fairly compelling narrative in which we're still living through kind of just the most recent ripples of precisely that catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I this know fragmentation, this this utter fragmentation that's market driven in, in a certain respect. I think you could you can tell a fairly continuous history from today all the way to the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear to me that, you know, it's not clear to me that there are any lessons from that period of how things might settle. Okay. Because I don't know what I see from that moment. What I see from the beginning of modernity really is a kind of large scale, longer term process of perpetual fragmentation. You have some, you have some creation of large scale systems, you know, you have modern States and you have the international system. And then, you know, you, you definitely see some, uh, uh, kind of unifying, aggregating uh, efforts. Obviously, the totalitarian countries and, and projects of the of the 20th century. You can think of lots of efforts in modernity hmm. to try and uh, harness, you know, technological power to build something really large and centralized. But for the most part, those tend to end badly. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you think about like you know the anarchist critique of of how how states perceive populations by someone like James C. Scott, right? Seeing like a state. Uh, if you think about just the, the obvious horrors of both left wing and right wing kind of uh, large scale totalitarian politics in the 20th century. Hmm. Um, and you even just look to simple things like the nation state today and how it's kind of increasingly sclerotic and seemingly unable to uh, do anything compared relatively to, you know, the, the nimble and agile 
uh, movements of small scale startups and, and things mm-hmm. things of this nature. It just seems to me that the story of modernity is one of increasingly centrifugal forces in which so people have tried to kind of harness them for big organized things, but the big organized things tend to always come crashing down, it seems mm-hmm. to me. Or at the best, they kind of stall out, become big, sclerotic, and useless. And then all of the action, all of the energy is in people competitively coming up with new ideas, exiting the sclerotic ones, and doing something new in, in, in small, fragmented, increasingly centrifugal hmm. uh, ways. But is there is there a way to avoid all out warfare and still keep the spirit of innovation going, the spirit of, of contest and competition? It's a great question. It's a great question. I certainly think it's worth a lot of energy to try and figure out if there is a way to prevent conflict. To be honest, I'm not I, I'm not so bearish on on conflict. I mean, I do think that there are a lot of forces at play right now that if you know, we, you can imagine things playing out in ways that lead to something like actual violence or civil war. I think, you know, a lot of people probably underestimate the probability of that, uh, of actual, you know, serious civil war kinds of dynamics being uh, mm. in the cards, yeah. maybe for, you know, Western societies. I think the average person probably somewhat underestimates the the how possible that could be. But I don't think it's it's at all probable. You know, mm. I don't think it's it's impending doom. And I think Um, certain people who tend to kind of fetishize collapse narratives and, um, you know, uh, doomsday scenarios. I think there's a certain type of community that you can find kind of on the internet that I think overestimates the, 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 the violence propensities of, of the current situation. Yeah. I don't know if that's uh, a useful answer to you, but that's the way that I think about it. I mean, I think I tend to take a kind of small scale approach to this and i think that like what you what what's most probable as a a kind of desirable outcome is you see more and more individuals especially kind of like thought leaders in their community and this is a pretty small scale thing like i don't mean uh famous people i mean you know people who in their community are respected and who people look to for advice and Mm -hmm. and who will kind of take their take their lead because they tend to be you know uh forthright and responsible Those people, I think, will increasingly see that this like large centralized uh, kind of insane media driven social game, the the legacy games are are completely just losing, losing uh, wagers in every possible way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The responsible kind of thought leaders of like local communities will increasingly just of their own accord withdraw all of their attention and energy from these like centralized uh, social games Hmm. and focus on. Uh, improving like what's around them and and improving their community hmm. and inc- improving their families and stuff. And I think you can imagine that kind of thing filtering through the larger like media bubbles as a kind of contagion phenomena. So hmm. to me, I think that's like the, the 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 best thing that could possibly happen is the fragmenting dynamics are allowed to kind of continue, but everyone in their own unique little pockets uh, learns how to um, optimize like their own lifestyles within each pocket Mm -hmm. and to the point that they basically uh become sufficiently healthy and self-sustaining that they're not even really worried about each other not even paying attention to each other yeah anymore yeah you know i think that's realistic and positive relatively yeah it seems though that there is a contingent within academia and the op-ed activist crew of trying to stir up crap, uh, you know, call, uh, calling out one, one example that I'm thinking of right now is the um, is uh, like uh, talking about whiteness or imperialism and decolonizing and projecting this totalitarian force that's implicit within uh, Western culture and trying to attack that. And, and I worry that they're trying to start some shit that they can't really see to the end of. They're just, you know, they're, I don't know what game they're playing, but it seems like it's not a really healthy game. Uh, do you see that within academia or am I projecting that onto? I definitely know what you're talking about and I see the reasons why you, you think about it in the way that you do, I think. And I, I think it's not, it's not implausible the way you're describing it or characterizing it is not implausible. The way that I see it, I think, is, well, I I agree with you that I think there is a lot of activity, kind of social, cultural signaling activity that you find in academia and and kind of the liberal intelligentsia professions more generally, um, where people are basically kind of summoning forces that 
um, if brought to their ultimate conclusion, those people would would not be happy to have summoned. I think I, I agree with that. I think. Yeah. Um, I think, though, that it's 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 mostly people following pretty simple heuristics. You know, there's no grand kind of strategy or yeah. grand organized um effort or long game i don't think that there's much of a long game i think there's a lot of anxiety and and short-term kind of panic mm -hmm. um i think the, the background for a lot of it is the dwindling economic prospects for moderate iq people in the western societies i think hmm. that that's a to me that's that's one of the key kind of background factors increasingly you know we we are increasingly in a winner-take-all economy and that has to do with certain aspects of 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 the nature of digital products of mm -hmm. the of the contemporary economy today you know in other words in you know the intuition here is if you're really really super smart and you're good at hacking computers and putting together complex systems that functionally work well you can do really well for yourself if you know as a as a citizen of a western country uh short of that even if you're like in the fairly high iq but moderate high iq range mm -hmm. um but you're not like a whiz with computers and you know you can't really solve super complex problems, but you're, you know, you're someone who, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago would have been seen as like, you know, um, very smart person. Um, well, you have a, that's the type of person I think today that's really kind of panicking because they are smart and mm -hmm. they can do interesting and valuable things with their mind and they want to, and they deserve to. And they also want and expect based on historical expectations mm -hmm. to have a fair bit of status and respect for for their, you know, fairly high, but only moderate, moderately high intelligence. And what's happening now is that you only really get a truly good lifestyle with a, with comfort, with a lot of comforts and respect and, and status and influence. If you're in the, the, the really highest, um, you know, percentiles of, of the intelligence distribution, that's what it looks like to me. And so yeah. what happens when, when that happens as an, as a kind of background economic context? Well, guess what? Those people aren't just going to like go home quietly and accept that, you know, there's no real good jobs for them. They're going to, they are, here's the thing. And this is the problem. They are smart. They're certainly smart enough to make complex word arrangements on the internet. You know, they're, they're smart. They're, they're certainly smart enough to kind of pull, um, the levers and push the buttons of less smart people, the, yeah. the larger, you know, you know, the larger group of, even lower IQ people in society, yeah. you know? So I think what you're actually seeing the whole kind of SJW phenomenon is moderately high IQ people whose prospects are dwindling, but who their main opportunity for cultural influence and for money and power is to basically create moralistic word games yeah. and then kind of impose them on the larger mass of dumber people. I mm -hmm. think that's basically the way that I see it. Huh, that's a, that's a phenomenal waste of energy though. Uh, you're it not depends what you're trying to optimize. Okay, right? I guess that that's true. If you're if you're trying to optimize lasting social change and and uh, positively egalitarian society, possibly that'll work out good. But uh, again, like you're playing with forces that y you don't know where they're gonna where not only where they're gonna go, but where they're gonna push you to go. You're gonna you're gonna get addicted to that attention, and then you're gonna play more and more word games, and the word games are gonna take over, and you're gonna become a demagogue or or whatever. Um, I think I think that's a good uh, projection. Uh, that's a reasonable prediction. I think you're right that that is very possible and perhaps even likely. I just think that for hmm. the the type of person that you're you're describing and trying to understand, that's just seen as well. There, I think there are two psychological kind of processes that 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 come in, come into the mind of that person that make them not reckon with what you just said. One is that maybe you're right, Benjamin, but everything we're doing is basically just self-defense against the people who have actual power, which is capitalists and, you know, like white men and whatever it might be, um, mm -hmm. and depending on the person's uh, perspective. But it can always be kind of justified. People tend to justify these things, what they're doing in a particular, you know, cultural moment with respect to, they see themselves as, as being forced to just basically defend themselves and, and weaker people, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, someone more powerful started it somewhere down the line or something. Mm -hmm. I think that that goes very far in the psychology of, of mm -hmm. people. And so they think like, if that is true, Benjamin, if those things might happen down the line, well, it's not my fault. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> defending myself basically. Well, it um, seems like you're in, in a situation where, uh, people have targeted you for words that you've used on the internet. 
and and they've made some moral dec- declarations or moral judgments on you, and now now you're in a bit of hot water with your institution. How do how do you how does that change your your thoughts about the, that moralistic force that's uh, being a bully in in this in the name of justice in the name of protecting other people? Well, first of all, I should clarify to be a responsible citizen that I have no idea what my university is thinking or doing. I, uh, I, it's to the degree there's anything happening, it's totally confidential. So I, I can't even talk about it. But, um, and also I should say, you know, you had said that I'm in hot water. It's not even clear that I'm in hot water, at least not yet. I mean, <laughs> I, I, there's no, there's no, currently there is no, uh, disciplinary, um, action on me yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I'll keep you posted on that, but for the time being, I'll have to be somewhat mysterious and uh, not really clarifying any of those details. But, but we can talk uh, about other cases where this has happened, where people say things on the internet and then the moralistic force comes in and consumes them and they get fired or shoved out or right. whatever. Uh, yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, your question is fine. I, I was going to move on to answer it. I was just giving that kind of caveat so this isn't uh, played back to me at some future possible <laughs> uh, disciplinary event. And um, what I would say is, I mean, nothing that's happened to me uh, recently or not recently has affected me very much because, I mean, I've been thinking about these things for a very long time. Now, I, the past several years, I've been thinking almost full time about precisely these cultural politics. So mm-hmm. this, is, this is what I've been blogging about and thinking about and talking about. For me, it all started actually more than almost two years ago, about a year and a half now when I I kind of had my my final break with like the activist left um, that I was kind of pushed out of like a, a radical left group that I was an activist in. Mm-hmm. That was when I had my moment of reckoning where I was like, I really started to that shook me into high gear to start thinking about these things. Um, so n- none of the flack that I've gotten since then over the past year or whatever from any institution or individual on the Internet has surprised me or shaken me or, mm-hmm. or messed up my you know attitude towards these things. Because the way and in fact, it's quite the opposite. Like I'm now playing a different game is what I would say. Probably Mm. about a year ago, a year and a half ago when I realized how bad things have gotten culturally, how sensitive the entire culture has become. It basically became clear to me that if you want to be an intellectual in today's society and Western society today. And by intellectual, I mean, you know, live a whole intellectual life where you give your you give everything to trying to figure out, you know, the most pressing and dangerous puzzles that you can figure out mm-hmm. at whatever cost may come. Like if that's the game, if that's what it means to be an intellectual, as, as I believe it is, um, the entire kind of mainstream institutional culture right now is so sensitive that you simply cannot um, submit to even trying to kind of tiptoe around all of the all of the prohibitions Mm -hmm. and even have a chance at making any kind of significant intellectual progress because there are so many, there are so many prohibitions to tiptoe around that you'll spend your entire life tiptoeing that you'll you'll never get around to actually working on the, the meat of the puzzles that you're most interested in. And so I just decided a year ago, basically that, and to me, I think this is the rational strategy for like any intellectual within academia or outside of academia is to just make a, a, a principled decision to not give a shit, say whatever you want, be completely authentic, and just trust that your own ethics will, huh. you know, that, like, trust in your own ethics. Like, I don't say things that I think are truly bad. I don't, I try to be a good person. But but other than that, I say whatever the fuck I feel like saying in that moment because I'm confident, you know, it's probably mm-hmm. not harming anyone. And just because a bunch of people might say it harms someone, I'm not going to stop and think twice about that. I'm going to okay. assume those people are crazy idiots because the world is filled with so many crazy idiots. <laughs> that might sound cruel, but I feel like that's how that's the heuristic that you kind of have to have. And well, then just plow forward okay. and let the chips fall. Let the chips fall where they may. That's what that's how I see it. Yeah. Uh, the the other strategy is to find those little sensitive nerve endings and start to play with them. And I think Trump is a master of that, or at least mm. took advantage of that as much as possible and still does. You can, you can, you can play foot, uh, footsie with it. Uh, you can ignore it and just barrel through, or you can say, you know what, this is an opportunity. 
the, these nerve endings are an opportunity. And then, and then you can either take advantage of them or you can try to, to write them or, or try to figure out why the, that sensitivity is, is exposed and figure out ways of, of making it less sensitive. Do you, do you think that it's a worthwhile project to try to stop the culture from being so sensitive or is that just not a worthy goal for you personally? Oh, I'm definitely all for trying to make the culture less sensitive. I think that different people are equipped differently to do that through different tactics, though, I think. Yeah. And I think there are probably multiple pathways to having that type of effect. For me, I'm temperamentally suited to the to the tactic of just inundate it with, you know, authentic, honest, uh, yeah. insensitivity for irrational sensitivities. Okay. And do hmm. you know what I mean? Like my, yeah. my wager, my wager is kind of like, if, 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 if basically good people and basically smart people just cultivate a kind of radical nonchalance towards the million hmm. sensitivities that all the people have, and you just go hardcore on whoever the, whoever the fuck you really are, like just say what you actually think and feel yeah, somewhat insensitively. Um, People will adapt to it quite quickly. One, because it's cool. I mean, it's it's refreshing. People love to listen to yeah. it. People like to listen to that. People like to be around that. People like to be friends with that because it's just authenticity, right? It's just being yeah. yourself. It's irresistible to most people. So people will like it for the most part. And also the other thing people don't realize is you will unleash in yourself productivity and effectiveness that you didn't even know you had. Like people don't realize how much potential they're wasting by constantly self-censoring themselves. Yeah. Before they even say things like if you just agree, if you just allow yourself to to not tiptoe around anything and just say what you think and feel whenever you think and feel it. Yeah, you're going to ruffle some feathers, but you're going to unleash, a you know, a, a kind of uh, effectiveness hmm. and, and productivity that you didn't even know you had because you've been taxing yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my friend Diana Fleischman likes to talk about um, all the different types of sensitivities and moral objections that people have today. She, she calls them cognitive reparations. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I think that that's a that's a really clever way to put it, because in a sense, it is people who don't really like thinking that much. They're not very good at thinking and they don't really want people who like to think and who are good at thinking to be able to think as much as they're able to. So hmm. it's like a way it's a way for like dumb people to basically impose taxation on on smarter, more, more, more free and relaxed people who, you know, yes, Intimidate that's dangerous. It's, yeah. it's always going to be dangerous. But. You don't have to pay that taxation. And if you just refuse to pay the taxation, you become uh, wealthy in ways that you don't even realize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you enrich those around you. Absolutely. Which would be the Adam Smith view of wealth. And, totally. And totally. So that's right. what set you on the path of becoming an academic then? On the question of like, should people become academics or like... No, like what? personally you, like you're uh, biographically speaking, like how did you end up being an academic what set you on that path oh yeah well um i come from like a poor family uh, a kind of hardcore working class like military sort of family and uh none my parents were never educated there was not much money around and i just like didn't i just wanted to get out of my hometown so that kind of story and once i went to, i was lucky enough to go to university and once i was in university you know i like to read books i'm a pretty brainy dude i like to read and write and um i basically uh, well, I guess I've always had a kind of, uh, I've always had this streak about me where I'm, I'm very temperamentally kind of anarchist. Like I've always hated authority figures. I've always gotten in trouble everywhere from like third grade to today, wherever <laughs> I've been, I, I'm always getting in trouble. Um, and basically I learned early on, probably like third grade was the first time I had this kind of insight that like a lot of my teachers just weren't that smart and like they were kind of stupid. And if I read a lot and I kind of thought a lot, I could come up with ideas that basically could <laughs> could um, like beat them. And in some sense, I, I kid you not, Benjamin, but like I'm an academic. I decided to become an academic because of this massive chip on my shoulder where I just wanted to basically be smarter than all of the idiot teachers that I had when I was a kid. And uh, that, yeah, basically, in some sense, that's. I, when I was in university and I just read a lot, mm -hmm. I didn't want to have to do like the shit I was supposed to be doing. So I was just like, okay, I'm going to just read a lot. I'm going to get really smart on the things I'm interested in. 
And hmm. if I if I can just stay inside this academic game, I'll get really close with like my academic mentors. Uh, if I can just stay inside this bubble, then I won't have to worry about like getting a job and I won't have to worry about like yeah. competing on the open market. Yeah. I'll just be like super brainy forever and be really smart. And then I'll like destroy all my enemies that way. Uh, <laughs> and I think now that I've arrived into academia and I've kind of got that chip off my shoulder and I'm now yeah. content that I'm now content that I'm smarter than my third grade teacher. Um, and I've really shown her who's boss. Now I'm kind of like, I've scratched my itch and I don't feel that strong of a need to be an academic anymore. <laughs> well, the, one of the ideas that floats around that surfaces now and, and, here and there and now and then is that the problem with academia is that there is no free market pressure on ideas so that really bad ideas can flourish because there's no pressure. Uh, there's no competition there. What do you think about, is there a possibility of introducing that pressure uh, or competition of ideas into academia? Like that Sokol squared hoax that came out, which kind of shows that there's this kind of crusty weirdness going on in certain districts of academia and how do we deal with that and how do we flush that stuff out so the real work can develop and, and flourish oh i don't think there's any flushing that out no personally okay it's no rooted. i don't think so i would correct one thing that you said though or i, yeah, I would quibble please. one thing that you said it's not that there's no there's no competition in academia there is a lot of competition in academia yeah the problem is what are people competing on yeah right so you know like the 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 most notoriously dumb uh, you know, cultural studies journals that are getting a lot of flack today, they are competitive in a sense. They're mm -hmm. just not competing on discovery of objective reality, okay. right? So they're comp what are they competing on? Well, they're competing on a bunch of things. Obviously, in some sense, you're competing for, it's, it's aesthetic competition, right? Like how beautiful does the turns of phrase in your like critical article sound yeah. to the editor? Um, how you know, how, how much sophistication are you able to affect, right? And then obviously to climb the ranks in academia, even in gender studies, you are still competing on things like conscientiousness, how much can you produce, uh, how much, hmm. um, you know, like even in gender studies, like the more you publish mm -hmm. in more elite journals, you know, higher ranked journals, uh, you know, the more accolades and money you're going to get. So there, there is intense competition. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's just, they're not competing on a search for the truth. Like hardcore proper scientists are competing to discover tidbits of, of reality. Right. Yes. And it's a, it's a kind of competitive game to prove or disprove, um, you know, people's models of the world. So they're like in a, in an ideal scientific discipline, you're competing for, um, discovering the nature of, of something real and empirical in, in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, 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 the disciplines that have gone astray, it's not that they're not competitive. Yeah. They are still competitive. It's really hard to get a tenure track job in gender studies. You have to be really good at the game of gender studies. Yeah. It's, it's cutthroat competition. It's just a totally different type of competition. You're competing on all of these other soft human types of soft skills, you know, yeah. like aesthetics and, and morality and, and sophistication and also, you know, things like cultural capital, like who is your mentor, yeah. this sort of stuff. Right. So it's intensely competitive. It's just that okay. they're, they're competing on the wrong things. And so that's why I think there's no way there's no question, I think, of reforming any of it. I think the whole game of academia is that it's this um, protected structure. You know, yeah. it, it's 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 baked into the very nature of the career. It's why people want the career, basically, is that. If you can break into it and you can compete in that system and do well in that system, okay. The whole point is that you are you are you are cultivating a life in which you do not have to compete on an open market of value value provision. But you're still and, competing uh, on a closed market, then. Yeah, you're competing in these like internal like arbitrary hierarchies. Okay, interesting. But, but there's the the idea of like somehow fixing gender studies or, you know, the more astray disciplines. Um, by the way, I don't think all of it's bad. I think just some parts of it have gone really totally off the rails. Mm -hmm. Um, the idea of like, I don't think there's any fixing that. I think the best you could hope for is through kind of public ridicule and public, um, awareness. Uh, it just, it starts to wither away and people don't want to go into it anymore and there's no funding and it just kind of, just kind of goes away. But the idea of like converting it into some like, more scientific truth seeking discipline. I mean, I, I don't see any pathway to that, but okay. maybe someone can figure it out. Well, uh, speaking of the, the scientific game where you're trying to prove or disprove models of the world, 
right? How how would that how would that possibly translate into the public intellectual, the internet, the I intellectual maybe, or the internet intellectual? Like, is that is that a game that can be established without the rigorous uh, peer review process, relying relying solely on the audience, the numbers, and then exposing yourself to to clashes of interest with other people? That's a really good question. And actually, I'm glad you asked it because I've been thinking about this for a long time and I've never really written much about it or in some ways I'm experimenting with it uh, in a practical sense with my own work. But um, I don't think I've spoken on this or written about it. So it's a good question. I think it's important to realize that you can have robust systems of, of peer review or at least, you know, strong systems of. Uh, kind of collective accountability really is the is a yeah, more general exactly. way to think about it great without having centralized structures I mean if you get a bunch of smart people in a, any type of community even with no rules but they're all there because they're trying to seek the truth and they're smart enough to hold each other accountable to what is good method and what's not method and what's believable and what's not believable as soon as those people are competing for status you're going to have a pretty legitimate you, you can have a mm. pretty legitimate kind of scientific accountability community, um, even without any hmm. centralized, uh, uh, you know, punishments or, or rewards. In There's, some sense, I mean, yeah. you see this in parts of the blogosphere in the better parts of the blogosphere, um, like people, people have incentives to converge on the truth yeah. and they have disincentives to get it wrong because other smart people will call them out for being wrong. Yeah. So. I don't think that that's uh, a very hard institutional design problem. Yeah. Um, I think the the bigger problem actually is the the monetization model. You know, how do you reward that enough yeah. that the, enough smart people want to do it? And my thinking is because I'm this is kind of exactly where I'm at with my own very life right now is that currently you can get a good income by being an academic. If you're really smart and you're good at, you know, doing research and stuff like that, you can, if you're lucky, get a, get a good stable income as an academic. But the bullshit that you have to go along with is increasing every year. Mm -hmm. And the amount of time and energy you actually get to spend to doing real research is, you know, for a small elite who can get big grants, maybe it's staying st stable, but for like the average, you know, intellectual, um, it's harder and harder to actually just have free time to do interesting work. So my model is, and this is far from tested, I'm, I'm kind of testing it iteratively at the moment. Uh, so, you know, maybe watching me in the next year or two would be an interesting test case, but I'm not, so I'm not, I can't at all guarantee this is going to work. But my hypothesis or my sense is that for someone like me, who's very self-motivated and very kind of passionately interested, and also I have the lucky feature that I study mostly kind of secondary quantitative data sets. So like public freely available big data sets that are already out there and are free. I don't really need grants. I don't need anyone's uh, permission. I don't need money. I don't need a lab. Yeah. Um, for someone like me, I actually wonder if I were to start doing all of my kind of professional level academic research autonomously. And instead of the, the, the main publishable unit being this like 30 page journal article that goes through three p rounds of peer review and takes the academic system 1.5 years to, to actually turn into print. Instead, I just changed the, 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 the production process a little bit to turn all of that work into basically blog posts. Yeah. And I wonder if the time that I would save from just quitting academia or being fired or whatever the case might be, uh, however that, however it pans out, if I just put all the time into doing full-time academic intellectual research on my own terms, however yeah. I wanted, uh, I wonder if you could you could find a model that's something kind of like my comparison cases would be something like I don't know if you know like Maria Popova's Brain Pickings. Uh, I think it's BrainPickings.com. It's a very large, successful, influential blog. Hmm. Um, you know, and she does all of the kind of typical monetization things that blogs do. You know. Uh, tip jars and patreon and mer merch and you know whatever you know the, all the different things that people can do nowadays but it's basically she just kind of digs up um useful insights and and interesting anecdotes from old mm -hmm. books and you know it's it's basically a kind of intellectual um uh you know biblio bibliophilic kind of uh, aesthetic but it's very it's somewhat academic it's very you know um people there's a it shows that there's a very large demand for kind of highbrow educated insights 
um, curated in a, very, in a very thoughtful way. Yeah. That would be one example. And then other examples would be like, um, you know, you look at something like 538.com, you know, they do like blog posts of like quantitative data analysis as kind of like news. Yeah. You know what I mean? I kind of wonder if there's a model for like the individual content creator version of an academic where I basically just do all of my academic research full time. I do like one nice high quality b- blog post a day uh, in my own kind of aesthetic with my own style. And it, and it's kind of edgy and interesting to people because I get to say whatever the fuck I want in my own language. Yeah. And it has a kind of appeal to it that most academics aren't allowed to have. I actually wonder if that could be, it obviously isn't gonna make me rich, but I actually wonder if that could be interesting and valuable enough to people that it would give me maybe, let's say, if it gave me, if I could get even 35% of my current income through doing that, mm-hmm. it kind of is worth it because I wouldn't have to do all the bullshit I have to do currently <laughs> to get my to get my income. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I think there's something maybe there. And I, yeah. I, that's kind of what I've been doing over the past year with yeah. a lot of success, but I've only started to kind of think about like how to do it more strategically. Yeah. I wonder if um, the, the problem or one of the problems, not necessarily a problem, but the question that I have is that can you do something that's a centralized project? Can you you would have to break it down into little episodic pieces, right? You'd have to be kind of Cervantes with your dissertation and, and, you know, always have a cliffhanger. Like think, think kind of like a, think like a a pulp writer, you know, kind of use the pulp genre to, to extrapolate, to build a bigger project. Cause that's the, that's the thing that you wouldn't be able necessarily to do unless you strategize, strategized it. Like within academia, you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make a book. It's going to take me 10 years to write this book. I'm going to do this book and it's going to last 50 years. It's going to, it's going to be worth reading for 50 years, but I need the time to really check every little bit of it. And the thing is, is that with the internet model or the blogosphere model is that you would have to always have have a tentative everything's always tentative like i'm going to do the best i can with this one piece and i'll go back and revise it later and i think people are, are amenable to that yeah i think i think that's that's the ideal way to do it right i mean all scientific knowledge is should be understood to be uh, provisional until it's mm-hmm. until it's improved or disproven by you know the next person and that's so that's good i mean do you know scott alexander do you know the slate star codex blog mm, i don't know I don't he's know. An interesting, this... He's an interesting case. Uh, as I said, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot and I've done a lot of research on different types of people's models, but yeah. he's kind of like a rationalist. Uh, and he's a, I think he's a psychiatrist by profession, but he just, you know, is really smart, really brainy kind of guy who writes a lot. And he writes these really long, thoughtful blog posts and he has like a big community around him and a, and a deserved community because he's really smart and interesting and a, and a good blogger. But he's, I mean, his blog is very, very, very widely read. I mean, he could pro, you know, he's a good example of someone who's kind of already doing what I'm talking about, but in a less conscious sort of academic mold. Like I'm thinking about this as a specifically as a model for academics or prospective academics or unhappy academics to basically defect from the higher education institutions into a kind of rogue model. Um, but there are basically people who are already basically doing it. I'm just thinking about like, how can someone do it from scratch? from yeah. a position of, of of currently seeing themselves as an academic. And, yeah. you know, there are other examples also, like, I don't know if you've ever heard of fuck theory. Um, Maybe. But they this this person does, <laughs> this person writes, like, theoretical reflections on index cards and posts, like, one index card to Tumblr a day or something like that. Yeah. And Bill has, has built, a, he or she has built quite a following. And, uh, like, I think their Patreon is, is, is doing quite well. So, again, I think these things are already happening. Yeah. I'm kind of just at the beginning of this experimentation myself, but um, I think it's there. I think it's there for the taking. I'm interested in making it more explicit and and uh, kind of navigating it more more consciously instead of just like falling into it. Well, what's your, what's your particular project then at this point in time? What what do you want to investigate or think about or bring to light? Oh yeah, sure. So uh, well, I'm currently I am working on a book right now. I do have a more traditional proper literary agent right now. Oh, nice. Um, so that I am, that's my, that's kind of still from my traditional academia, uh, kind of perspective. So I, that's, that's one of the main things that I'm working on. And that is about the psychology of, uh, you know, the so-called social justice warrior. And, uh, oh, okay. the book, the book is called woke. And it's basically, I, I, I want to write the kind of, uh, 
the first like systematic comprehensive account mm-hmm. of you know who exactly this social justice warrior is what they think where they came from and and all of that using data and also using you know using data like a political scientist as i am but also using my rich store of kind of ethnographic data that i have for my for my own experiences mm-hmm. uh so so yeah that will hopefully uh be out sooner than later eventually and uh and what's the but, what's the what's the framework of that the or the what do you mean by framework like theoretical framework yeah theoretical framework and then what's do you, can you let us know a little bit about your judgment at the end oh or? yeah sure yeah. sure yeah i mean in some sense i'm happy to talk about it because because i'm thinking now more about how to build out the internet model what i'm basically doing is blogging and making videos and talking about this stuff in all different types of directions anyway so yeah, yeah. yeah i'm happy to um i'm happy to talk about it basically it's it's a pop it's intended to be a popular book so it's not going to be super heavy on fancy theoretical frameworks um but if for people who have read um it's basically a combination of of two theoretical frameworks you you could say one people will know a lot about if you know if you read people like Jonathan Haidt for instance um i it's it's like basics in uh, moral psychology mm-hmm. is is one half of it so everything you got from Jonathan Haidt's you know the righteous mind and uh, so it's first just m- making people see what it means to make, uh, you know, moralistic political c- claims in public. Like why, what are the actual underlying reasons why people do that? Yeah. Um, that's the first kind of half of things you need to know to understand like what the SJW is even is. Yeah. And then the second half of the story that, so that's not novel. I'm not breaking any ground in terms of psychology research or anything like that. Um, but the second half of the story that I want to tell that I think is unique and that I think is poorly understood is, well, I actually alluded to it earlier in the conversation. It's the larger kind of ec- economic and technological changes that we're living through. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you follow these other debates that I've been having with people, but I'm very interested in this idea of accelerationism, which is kind of roughly, uh, it's a kind of, uh, I, you could call it a kind of political theory um, if you'd like, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a framework for understanding uh, the course of technological change and political change in modernity as a whole. So it takes a very kind of large scale bird's eye view hmm. of, of the, the period that is modernity. Yeah. And it basically argues that modernity it's, it's we tend to see modernity as this kind of intrinsically explosive process, mm-hmm. um, characterized by lots of kind of exponential curves, right? So yeah. the, probably the more, you know, the, the most famous kind of representative of this is the idea of the singularity, right? Which is a kind mm-hmm. of somewhat sci-fi um, nerdy way of putting it, which you can have lots of debates about. But in many ways, in more ways than one, modernity is characterized by these these positive feedback uh, processes in which, you know, from a long history of, you know, a flat line in terms of economic growth and technological growth, all of a sudden modernity is the period where it starts to go like this. It mm-hmm. starts to go exponential. And so accelerationism is a kind of uh, viewpoint on the current cultural politics that sees one of the major key variables is just the extraordinarily rapid rate of change, basically. Yeah. yeah. And I think that when you take that really seriously and you process that, hmm. which uh, a lot of kind of mainstream academics don't take seriously, I think, when you see that as the background, you basically combine that idea with the kind of basic ideas from moral psychology that you get from someone like Jonathan Haidt. And I think that the larger picture that you get is that, um, the contemporary contemporary economic and technological changes are basically putting uh, unprecedented pressure on people, mm-hmm. and they're, it's increasingly crowding out kind of everyone but the most intelligent, uh, hmm. cr- you know, producers. And hmm. I think what's happening is you're seeing all types of uh, kind of cultural meltdown in which people's moral psychologies are being scrambled and kind of overheated basically mm-hmm. by. Um, by by rates of change that are completely at a kind of inhuman scale and uh something like the social justice warrior is just what happens when a particular type of person with a particular moral psychology basically just tries to uh navigate their way but in a kind of accelerating uh capitalist context in which uh they hardly know what's hitting them Mm -hmm. and what is the uh in the conclusion of the book what's the healing that you're going to bring to the social justice warrior. That's a great question. I am thinking about how to 
how to navigate that. I, I'm not sure exactly because yeah, as I alluded to, this is one of my beefs with kind of mainstream like prestige intellectuals and, you know, popular books with Penguin Press or whoever it might be. I guess I should stop talking shit about Penguin Press. <laughs> they're not, they're not going to give me a book deal if I, if I do, but um, whatever. This is my this is like my main beef with that whole type of intellectualism, which is you always have to come through with some sort of like nice sounding appetizing solution. Yeah. And um, to be honest, I'll be perfectly honest that whatever it is. My preference would be, I don't know, like if I don't have one, I don't want to give one, but I, you probably do have to have one. So I'll probably just think about that. Uh, I, the honest truth is I think what most authors do is they just tack that on at the end to make it sound good. So I'm just going to be transparent in telling you straight up that that's probably what I'm going to do. So I wouldn't take it with too I wouldn't take it too seriously, just okay. like I wouldn't have yeah. you take huh. too seriously the positive recommendations in any of these like mainstream books, because I don't think that they're very uh, compelling. Hmm. But um, I might come up with something better. Yeah, yeah. But you, you still see it as uh, I guess it's not a problem when you look at it as just a function of the pressures of the environment. The yes, the, the wokeness culture is just the function. You're reducing it down to accelerationism and, and these these key factors and then combining it with psychological insight. But it just seems like once you start talking about insight, then you're like, well, once I understand this thing, I can manipulate it or I can avoid it or I can stamp it out. Or like there's there's always like there's some sort of overture for solution or counter. Once you understand something, you can control it. So are you just going to wash guess... your hands of it at, at that point? That's I've a good question. It. And. You, you kind of helped me remember one of my, uh, I guess, attitudes towards that, which is I guess I'm inclined to think that the best way to kill bad ideas and stupid behaviors is to just reveal them for what they are as yeah. as clear as clearly and mercilessly as possible. Yeah. And that at a certain point when people are aware enough of like what's really going on, then the stupidity will just kind of dissipate and become and, and will kind of dissolve and go away. Yeah, that doesn't always happen, but I guess I'm kind of partial to that model. So like, I don't think that the proposed solutions in the concluding chapter of yeah. many like popular politics books are usually very good, but a good book can have that effect, that kind of unspoken effect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's implied. I have yeah. one more question. I have to, I have to wrap it up soon. Um, cause oh no, I wanted to be able to ask you questions too. But that's okay. Oh no, well, we can, we can do this again. I was um, keen to know more about like your model. Like, I want to know more about the kind of cultural politics behind everything you're doing and how you see it. And the, yeah, well, I mean, but we can, we can talk about it another time if you want. I guess I'll, I'll just briefly say that when I started going, what, what started me on this journey was being at a college called Evergreen State College and it had a big, big blow up. And I saw, I saw what led up to that. Uh, there was a huge protest. The college was taken over. You probably know the story. Everybody that watches me knows the story. And I saw the lead up to that. And there was things that were worrying me. And then I just started talking about it on the internet. I got a platform all of a sudden was handed to me. And then I started, you know, just like issuing video after video after video about that one topic, but always with my always with the question in mind, where, where am I going with this? What, what is this good for? There's, there's a mm -hmm. story. People want to know about the story, but what are we going to learn from the story and what can we take from the story and apply to other things? And so I've been thinking about using that. And I've, I think I have been using what I've learned from, from the particular instance of Evergreen, then apply it to other particular instances, but really kind of trying to see what, what do I really want to, uh, mm -hmm. to produce? and and to give and this is kind of the question that i had for you is mm. what's the difference between an intellectual and an educator because hmm. it's a good question i i, I, I model question. the intellectual life but i i want to be an educator i think that the the that's the substance that's the the value that i give i'm i'm, I'm a teacher of, of in some respect i mean i think that's a beautiful thing i think education is a very noble pursuit no doubt i would never disrespect it but i would say maybe that the the intellectual vocation is somewhat hmm. different in the sense that education implicitly seems to require, you know, like you care about kids and shit like that, you know, whereas the intellectual just wants the truth, uh, you know, has a certain kind of thirst for the truth hmm. that is almost it can be antisocial. It can be uncaring. It can be hmm. not very good for kids. It can be hmm. not, maybe even. 
bad for kids. Uh, it might not be teachable. It might not be amenable to anything that looks like education. Um, and so I think there's always been this kind of conflict between intellectual, the intellectual and the educator. Um, you can definitely do both. Like people have, people have done both. Uh, people have focused on one or the other. Um, but I do think that at their extremes, there is, there is this kind of tension, you know, maybe embodied most clearly in, uh, the whole myths around Socrates, right? Hmm. Um, in some sense, he's a pure intellectual because all he's doing is going around, you know, trying to poke holes in people's false arguments. Um, but in some sense, he is an educator for doing that. And yet, you know, he's ultimately put to death for corrupting the youth. Yeah. So that kind of Im that kind of embed that, that, that whole story kind of, I think, summarizes what I'm getting at, which is that like true intellectualism at a certain extreme gets defined by everyone around you as harming the youth. And so if you want to be an educator within the norms of a society and you mm -hmm. want to be respected as an educator, you kind of have to betray a little bit, maybe here and there you have hmm. to kind of betray the hard edges of intellectualism hmm. to, you know, keep appearances for the kids. Hmm. So do you, do you think of yourself as wanting to be more of an intellectual than an educator? I mean, you know, I love kids and all. I don't want to sound like well, a dick uh, you, or anything. Okay. Like, well, you, you talk about kids, but the college is about, right, is a 19-year-old still a kid in your eyes? It's a good question. Well, uh, just to answer your question, I think that um, I don't, I'm not trying to sound cold or, or cruel or anything like that. Or that's I'm not fine. Saying, like, you hate kids. That's great. I, I, I have no judgment. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I guess, though, to, to answer your question directly, if I had to choose... I, I personally am temperamentally more uh, interested in and dedicated to that kind of somewhat almost antisocial lust for the the most dangerous truths that I can hmm. I can access. Mm -hmm. And if I had to pick between doing that and hmm. being like uh, being accepted or respected as an educator, yeah, I, I would choose the former every day of the week. But I'm not I'm you know, I'm happy to educate and I, I'm happy to share what I know with people if, if they're interested in it, uh, hmm. whether they be kids or, a, you know, young adults. Mm -hmm. um, all I'm saying is that I think people would do well maybe to understand more explicitly and consciously that there are these trade offs between hmm. intellectualism and um, being like a friendly face for what other people think education should look like. OK. But is do you, the uh, do you have how a does, take on that? Well, I'm just thinking about like with taking that idea into the uh, the private, the public intellectual, the monetized public intellectual. You're so you're you're uh, what you're bringing to market in the online intellectual lifestyle is not education. You wouldn't think of it as education. You're not trying to adduce or develop people's skill set. You're simply presenting ideas and pu pushing buttons and hoping that people like that. I would say that the, the true intellectual is definitely going to um, produce some education as a byproduct, no doubt. Okay. So I'm definitely not saying they're mutually exclusive. Um, yeah. I'm, ju I'm just saying that they're, they're, are, they're only somewhat correlated and at their, at their extremes, there are trade-offs. Okay. So, um, no, I mean, I think if, if someone dedicates their life to radical intellectual pursuit and they write what they find and they share the, you know, they share their products of their journey as they do it. That's going to be hugely educational for many people who are so interested and, and attracted to that form of content, no doubt. And that's one of the reasons I'm interested in doing it. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's worthwhile for sure. No doubt. So I think, I think we, we agree, we would agree okay. on that for sure. Um, all I'm, all I'm getting at is that if you, if you set out, for your main purpose goal to be uh, to to educate someone, you can often find yourself falling into traps hmm. where your interest in either being seen as an educator or being respected by institutions as an educator, yeah. or maybe even getting access to people as an educator, getting access to students or pupils as an educator. The 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 sacrifices or costs that you have to pay to pursue the explicit goal of education in today's world mm -hmm. sometimes 
is so costly yeah. for the intellectual ask, hmm. for the intellectual pursuit side of it that you can be you can have a role as an educator in today's society and not act, actually educate them with any kind of real intellectual edge because okay. education today in many institutions has been so kind of uh, it's become so sensitive and it's become so political yeah. that, the, that the, the hard edge of intellectualism, that's the only thing that can actually educate anyone, has increasingly been kind of prohibited. Okay. So yeah, okay. all I'm saying is people should beware about getting into education for the sake of giving education because you can find yourself more easily than you might think being a respected and successful educator yeah. and having no intellectual life and in fact educating no one. Okay. Yeah. But okay. Thanks for clarifying that. I, I just, I, I'm just thinking about being a public educator similar mm. to being a public intellectual. Like, like, do they map onto each other? I, I think they do, but maybe the difference is that the educator is more focused on the audience, whereas the intellectual is more focused on the idea or the, or the discipline that they're working within and forwarding the discipline forwarding the arguments rather than than bringing people up to speed on the argument is that yeah i think that's that? a fine way to put it or you yeah. could just say it, it's like a difference of emphasis between mm. um you know the novel discoveries and the transmission or sharing of those discoveries okay. to other humans like yeah you know those are just different strengths or weaknesses i guess yeah and would you, like you might you might be strong in one but not so strong in the other yeah okay. um and you would focus your efforts on one or the other maybe yeah but you have to do both if you're going to be a public intellectual, if you're going to have people connect with you and want to follow you. It's it's yeah, not just probably. discovering the ideas, it's transmitting the ideas. Like you were saying when we were talking about Joe Rogan and stuff, like there's there's a way of communicating the, the ideas that will draw a certain um, certain class of people to you who jive with your particular skill set of communication. And then there's the ideas themselves where you maybe you go after other people who uh, who are who are focused on the same issues, but you're not connecting with them through their personality, through their charisma. You're you're focusing on the ideas and the way that they're dismantling the ideas and wrestling with them okay. on, on that. Sphere. I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. Do, do you have to run? Yeah, I should. I, I have to wrap up because I have uh, I've this split shift job where I work with kids. OK, cool. I'm not going to get you in trouble for talking shit about education, am I? <laughs> I haven't. I, I feel like I was defending education, that, but that was that was a good way to put it. Like, yeah, I do have a problem with the, the system of education, the institution or the institutions of education I see as overrun with certain sensitivity generating ideas that cause people to just stop actually doing the work of instilling uh, individuals with the ability to uh, think for themselves and to go after the truth. That's the problem with the education system right now. And that's why I would want to jump boat if I was ever in academia, which I'm not, I'm on the outside looking in uh, to, to try to figure out like, what is the, what is the next academia? What is the next education system? How can we digitize that? How can we decentralize that? What is the Napster of uh, Napster version of Oxford? You know, something like that. What would that yeah. be? Yeah. Right. Well, I would love to talk with you more. So we should try to, if it's, if you're interested in talking more, I would love to, maybe you come yeah. on my channel next time if you'd oh, be yeah. so kind. I will link your channel. What, what do you want people to know about you? Oh, whatever. Um, to connect with I you. Have a to... fair, I have a lot of free time on my hands at the moment. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, I mean, over the past year, I've just been blogging like hell and yeah. making videos. And I've, in particular, I've been doing a lot of live stream conversations where I talk with random people around the internet, usually yeah. people who represent like weird fringe ideological subcultures. That's mm. kind of been the recurring theme. So, you know, you might hear about strange pockets of the internet and I'll find like a representative from that weird pocket of the internet and I'll just have them on my, on my YouTube channel in a live conversation where I just ask them like, what are you all about? What do you actually think? Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's really kind of caught on. I, I've been quite pleasantly surprised how much people enjoy that. So there's a little audience and community brewing around that. But the main thing is I've just been blogging like hell and I do all of my creative work under this kind of little label I've just kind of invented for myself called Other Life. It's also, there's also an audio only podcast version of the live streams and the conversations that I've had. And um, yeah, so it's kind of other, other life is just basically like my other life outside of academia, like all the stuff I'm most passionately interested and curious <laughs> about. 
I've just been kind of doing that full time. However, the heck I feel like it. Yeah. And uh, I've just been experimenting wildly with all these different formats. And so, yeah, if people are interested in that. They can just Google around for it. It's not too hard to, well, I'll to find. Link it. And I'll link it. Don't I, worry I, about it. Yeah, I plan on. I, but I, but I, basically, I'm, I'm, I think I've already more or less made the transition, at least mentally and in terms of my workflow. Like I'm basically doing all of my I'm doing Internet almost full time now. Um, like, I don't know how it's going to pan out. I don't know how my academic like situation is going to pan out. Yeah, I certainly don't know how the money situation is going to pan out. But I'm basically doing all of my intellectual work in this kind of like really freewheeling uh, internet full-time kind of way. And uh, so that's where I'm at and we'll just see how it pans out. And what's, what, what, what would be your genre then or your, your, uh, your discipline that you're working with then if you had to choose? Well, one? so I'm a political scientist by, by profession. And as I said before in the, in the chat, my expertise is uh, the quantitative analysis of kind of large uh, data yeah. sets. And so a lot of my most popular blog posts over the past year have been uh, very large data analyses that I've done. So, for instance, I've like estimated the public opinion among Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson fans. And I found that, you know, there's a sizable faction of left wingers who really like Jordan Peterson. <laughs> um, that's something I'm really interested in because I study public opinion. And I'm really interested, as I told you, I'm writing this book about social justice warriors and yeah. the new ideological subcultures. I'm trying to understand who's really in what pockets of of the ideological space today because it's much more confusing than people think. So Jordan Peterson has a lot of left wingers. I also did a big data analysis on estimating the public opinion of Kekistan. I'm sure you've heard of it. The kind of alt <laughs> it's it's people call it an alt right kind of phenomenon. Is it? And it is. But okay. again, I, I I had this hypothesis that there's actually a lot of lefties hiding out in there and my data finds some evidence for that. And so I'm kind of I have these political science uh, research agendas where I'm kind of trying to tease out the reality of internet subcultures and public opinion. And then I also have, I blog about kind of theories of uh, technological change and I'm trying to basically understand um, hmm. like how do, how, what is the best way to think about the actual changes that we're living through and the, the extraordinary fragmentation that we're living through. As I talked about before, I think people underestimate how severe it is. And I think hmm. it, things are happening much more rapidly than any kind of normal like institutionalized academics really ha are able to keep up with just by the structure of their job really mm -hmm. and 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 so i'm trying to develop like vocabularies for um thinking about this like most you know rigorously and, and accurately and uh and then i also just do a bunch of like autobiographical stuff i just write a lot about my life and and, and i share a lot about what i'm thinking and feeling and i i think they're kind of separate i have separate kind of audiences or fans for hmm. these different types of things but that's kind of the package of who I am and what I'm putting out right now. And I just intend, intend on kind of continuing that. That's awesome. That's awesome. And Thanks, it, it, one last thought, you, you, we talk about fragmentation, but at the same time within Jordan Peterson's stuff, there's a, there's a huge, there's a whole bunch of different people. Uh, and then in Kekistan, there's a whole bunch of different people. So there might be fragmentation on the surface, but when you look underneath it, there's this huge root systems where things are much less fragmented, much more messy under the surface. Yeah, that, I, that's one way to think about it. Um, I mean, yeah, you, you can you can break it down in a bunch of ways, like okay. depending on what your depending on what your research question is, like depending on what you're trying to do, there might be different hmm. ways of, of breaking it down. That's useful. But um, I tend to think actually the major story that I've been if all of my my data analysis over the past year kind of presents one key finding that I would want people to remember from from right now, it's that um, and this will be one of the major kind of uh, platforms of, of the book when it comes out is that um, what people call the alt right. It actually contains a lot of people who are who are truly leftists, but who are hiding out from the politically correct SJW wing of leftism. So right now, the 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 that's one that's one that's one kind of strand of it. The other claim that I believe is true based on my data analysis that I, I would really want people to to uh, remember is that um, the uh, the current image of what the, the left wing activist is in the public mind today, basically the, the SJW, the kind of campus activist who wants safe spaces and trigger warnings and is offended by everything. That image of the leftist today, a lot of people, almost everyone who talks about this topic, from Jordan Peterson to the Weinsteins and, and, and everyone, assumes that those people, those crazy campus activists, are extreme leftists. 
and they're not extreme leftists. They're actually moderate leftists. They're extreme, but they're not extreme on leftism. They're they're actually only moderate leftists who are extreme on something I would call it authoritarianism. I think yeah. Brett would call it authoritarianism also. So they're extreme, but it's a, it's a crucial distinction that they're not actually extreme leftists. Everyone talks as if they're the crazy yeah. fringe extreme left and the moderate left has to bring them in. It's actually the opposite. It's the true radical leftists, the true ex- the true extreme solid left wingers who have to call the authoritarian leftists merely moderate leftists. And <laughs> all of my data shows that. Yeah. And it's a really important little wrinkle that almost no one has right yeah. at the moment. I, I've, I, I found that in my in- investigations into Evergreen, like like at Evergreen, there are true leftists who call out the protests for actually not being leftists, just authoritarian that's right. moderates and stuff. So it, it's an interesting little, uh, I don't know if that's wordplay or some sort of uh, miscategorization, but I guess if you categorize, categorize things more precisely, then you'll be able to undermine the the problems within that contingent i think so i think so i think it, it matters that if you can if you can map this out clearly for what it is it goes a long way to diffusing things in part because a lot of people th- there's a there's a silent majority on the left who think all of the political correctness stuff is stupid but they're just afraid to say it i'm hmm. sure you know people like that i know lots of people like that anyone on the left knows lots of people everyone agrees and almost everyone agrees in private that like the worst examples of political correctness activism are stupid. Um, but no one's willing to really go out and say, this is stupid because they're afraid of the flack that they're going to get. They're afraid of getting fired, whatever. They're afraid of being called ableist or whatever it might be. And uh, that's a major problem of preference falsification. And one of the best ways to uh, solve problems of preference falsification is um, you get the actual truth of people's opinions out there. And once everyone can see how the public opinion actually breaks down, it incentivizes the silent majority to actually just be straightforward and honest. And then that, that's how you can kind of dislodge hmm. a kind of small minority from having this like uh, disproportionate power over the image of the entire group. Yeah, that sounds exactly what's happened to Evergreen. Exactly what's oh, yeah? happened to Evergreen. Yeah. Most, most professors are they're fed up with all the bullshit. Um, but the, so the, bubble, everybody, the bubble has popped. No, everybody's everybody's still silent. Uh, the, the people, oh, really? are, the 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 equity agenda has taken over and is is implemented uh, to to okay. disastrous effect to the actual running of the college, to the sci- the integrity of the sciences, the integrity of the humanities, the integrity of the freaking library, you know, and, wow. and then the the way that the administration's running with the money. Yeah. Funding. Are you still a student there? No, I, I graduated right before the protests, which was a year oh, okay. and a half ago. Yeah, but you so. still kind of have your your finger on the pulse. Of yeah, the yeah, I, I do. Uh, that's my ongoing, long running, uh, uh, what uh, Count of Monte Cristo thing that I, I just keep right. on putting out a episode every couple of weeks or so because I keep on getting data and, and showing what's going on. But but the same okay. thing is that if people actually communicated with each other, they could fix the problem. But it doesn't seem like they're doing that. Uh, okay. Well, you can tell me more about that on my channel if you will, if you'll join me sometime soon. Yeah, absolutely, Justin. Thanks a lot for joining me on mine. I will uh, let you know when this goes live, and you can share it on your Twitter if you want to. Of course. Thanks for hanging out with me, man. All right, Justin. Have a good night. All right, I'll talk to you later, dude. Cheers. See ya.